Good morning, good morning, good morning, sisters. This is the day that the Lord has made, the second Sunday in the month of Sept September. We should rejoice and be glad in this day. It's a day that we've never seen before. It's a day that we'll never see again. Just as every day is, it's the Lord's day and Jesus is Lord. But sisters, there's something about Sunday morning, something about us gathering together and upholding one another and praying for one another. Tiffany, thank you for that beautiful prayer. And Yvonne, we love you, sister. We are praying for you. So what a blessing it is to see all of you this morning and to lift up the name of Jesus together. The Bible says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the sisters to dwell together in unity. And you know, since we're all individuals with individual issues, the only way we can be in unity is to all focus on the one who is high and lifted up, the one who is Lord of all, the one who gave his life for you that you might be a part of his forever family, the one who sits high and looks low, the one who knows the end before you even know the beginning, the one who is leading and guiding you into the truth of his word, the one who said that he would never leave you, he'd never forsake you, the one who loves you with an everlasting love. Sisters, it's all about your vertical relationship with the Lord. And you have to forget about yourself this morning, concentrate on him and let's worship him. Sisters, we serve an awesome God. He's full of grace. He's full of mercy. He's full of truth. He is love and he's the same yesterday, today and forever. There's not a time when he's not with you. There's not a time that he'll not hear you when you call. He said that you can enter into the throne room to find grace to help in time of need. Sisters, he is always present. Present. He is always now and he is worthy. He is worthy of our praise. No matter what we are going through, sisters, God is worthy of our praise because he is with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. So this morning, you know, as many of us are preparing to go to the Midwest Conference uh, in Pontiac in just a few days, you know, I was just impressed by the Holy Spirit to give a word of encouragement this morning. And it's a kind of a combination of different things that I've talked about in the past uh, with some additions. And, and, and as I wrote this lesson, I was just so encouraged. And, and I hope that, that you will be encouraged as you listen to this lesson. You may recognize some parts of it, but it's okay. The word never gets old, sisters. The word never gets old. And every time we hear it, it's fresh and it's living and it strengthens our relationship with the Lord. So sisters, understand the word never gets old, sisters. You know, I, I love the Psalms. And when I read the Psalms, I get hope from the Psalms. And, and I've learned that I can smile through painful issues in life. So this morning, we're going to gain encouragement from one of David's Psalms in Psalms 55. And we're going to look at three points in our lesson this morning. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at what is it to smile and point two, I would fly away. And point three, pain is pain, but. So you're gonna learn that even though you may be hurting, you can smile as you go through the various trials that life brings to bear on us all. James one and two will become a reality to you. Count it all joy when, not if, but when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Sisters, you can, you can make it this morning. You're committed to, you are connected to the source and he knows just where you are, sisters. Your life is in his hands and he has promised that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint, sisters. You can make it, sisters. You can make it no matter what you're going through, no matter what issues you might be facing in your life, sisters. You can make it because of who you are and to whom you belong. So this morning, we're going to look at hope from the Psalms, and we're going to look at smiling through the pain in Psalm 55. So when you think about smiling, what do you think? Well, when someone smiles, it's showing that normally it's showing that they're thinking happy thoughts, that you're pleased with something or someone. A smile, it indicates a feel good emotion. A smile says something to the one who was the recipient of your smile. A smile is the opposite of a frown. Just as a smile indicates good feelings, a frown indicates displeasure at someone or something. Someone said that a smile is a frown turned upside down. So just a few facts about smiling, what it can do for your health. Smiling can trick your brain into feeling happier. It can improve your health. Smiling is contagious. You know, when you see someone smiling, you just naturally smile back. So smiling is a stress reliever. When you smile, your body releases endorphins that help you feel better and relieve stress. 
Smiling, they say, can be tied to longevity. There are 19 types of smiles. Is the smiling help you look more intelligent? Smiling lowers your blood pressure. Smiling puts you in a better mood. And then know there are a whole lot of different kinds of smiles. And we know they are deceptive smiles, but a genuine smile is a universal sign of happiness and greeting. Now you may not speak the language of some people, but a smile is a language. When you talk baby talk to a baby, you know, it's not the baby talk they respond to, it's a smile on your face when you talk to the baby. Her, a person is more attractive when they smile. You know, the baby has no idea what you're saying, but the baby sees a smile on your face and that's what they respond to and the baby smiles back. You know, we sing a song, God has smiled on me. That means that God looks on you with favor and God feels good about you being his child. God gave us the ability to smile. He gave us the ability to laugh. So we should use those as much as possible. A laugh begins with a smile. Proverbs 17, 22 says, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a wounded spirit dries up the bone. Sister, keep that merry heart. That's where your medicine is, okay? So this morning, uh, I don't want to talk about smiling as a feel good emotion. I want to look at smiling as a verb. I want to look at smiling as an action word and not an emotion. And I want you to see that in order to smile through the pain of issues in your life, you have to understand another aspect of this word. So point one, what is it to smile? So I want to look at this in a way that we may not understand the word smiling. So when we think of someone smiling, we think of someone who's happy. We think of an emotion, but I'm not going to look at smiling as a feeling, as this word is used in this topic, it's a verb, it's an action word, not an emotion. When I researched this word, one of the meanings of the word smile is to express approval and to have a pleasant disposition. And this has to do with your thought processes. So first of all, let's look at, our, at uh, some of our definitions and they're on your handout. So the smile means to express approval and to have a pleasant disposition in the midst of difficult issues. Through is in spite of, pain is distress or torment or anguish or tribulation, a position to take a stand and not be moved. Remember we uh, talked about last, uh, last few weeks about the, about the armor of God, having done all stand. So your position, that's to take a stand and not be moved. Dis means to go beyond the, pre, the suffix dis, or prefix dis, D-I-S means to go beyond. Disposition is to take a position and stand beyond what is expected in a situation. So to smile for our purposes is to express approval and have a pleasant disposition in the midst of painful issues. And this has to do with your thought processes. What are you to express approval of and what should be your disposition? So to smile through the pain is to express approval of the word and not let your disposition reflect, I'm sorry, and to let your disposition reflect the word as you experience the pains and distresses and the trials of life. Your disposition means taking a position that's beyond what is expected. The suffix dis means to go beyond. So your, your disposition is the stand or the position that you take as you smile through the pain, as you look to the word, as you approve of the word, in spite of the anguish and torment that you may be going through, that you go beyond what would normally be the case. You go beyond what is expected. James 1 and 2 says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. In uh, Jesus said in St. John 16, 33, these things I've spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Romans 12, 1 and 2, you know that's what you know, you all know that's my base scripture. I beseech you, therefore, sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove our approve of what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we and we know that God's will is his word. And then 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So to smile means to approve of the word and not your issues or your tribulations. So if you're in the midst of an issue, how do you go through that issue? 
What is your attitude? What is your disposition as you go through? You can't change the trial, but you can adjust your thinking. You may be crying, but you can smile in the midst of your tears. You can approve of the word and you can, you can look beyond the trial and see the joy. Psalms 30 verse five says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You express approval of the word of God that'll never change. The reason for your weeping will change. Circumstances change. Your issues change, but the word of God is steadfast and your disposition or your position becomes one of faith and trust in the word. You look beyond the pain. You look beyond the distress and you see the joy smiling through or in spite of the issues that you're being confronted with. It's all about your vertical relationship with the Lord, learning to stand on his word, taking up your position and not being moved from that position, having done all stand. Now, Jesus has said in this life, you have tribulation. There will be various issues of life, but the promise is that we can be of good cheer because he said he has overcome the world. So as we turn to Psalm 55, this is a Psalm of David, and it was in the midst of extreme distress that this Psalm was written. The nation of Israel was in the midst of turmoil and confusion. David's own son, Absalom, was trying to take away the throne from, from his father. Absalom wanted to be king and David in verse one through five, he's praying to God, asking God, hear my prayer. He's saying he was in mourning. He was in distress. His heart was pained within him. He said he was oppressed because of the hatred of his enemies. Let me just read verse one through six, sisters. He, David said, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplications. Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity among, uh, uh, upon me, and in my wrath they hate me. My heart is sore, pain within me. Listen to the distress, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and the horror hath overwhelmed me. And I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. So my point number one, sisters, I would just fly away. David said, oh, that I had the wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. Can you feel the anguish of David in these verses? Can you understand the, his desire to want to get away from it all? Have you ever been in a distressful situation? You just wanted to get away from everything, just fly away and be at rest and get away from hurtful issues that are happening. And I'm sure that this is something that we can all relate to. There are some things that happen you just don't want to even deal with. You just want to run away. You just want to fly away and be at rest away from all the turmoil and drama, away from all the pain. And we sometimes have the ostrich syndrome and we bury our head in the sand in hopes that everything will go away. But then in verse seven and eight, David said, Lo, then I would wander off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. David said, I just want to get away. I just want to get away. But what was causing David's anguish? What was causing his pain? Well, verses 12 through 14 says, For it was not an enemy. Listen to this, sisters. It was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was, was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man, mine own equal, my God, my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and we walked into the house of God in company. David was suffering distress. The nation was in turmoil. There was rebellion going on and his own son was trying to overthrow him. But David said, that's not the worst part of it. He said, the distress and the turmoil is coming from my very own friend, Ahithophel, my very own equal, a trusted friend. He said, we were so close. He said, we talked together. Together, we took sweet counsel together. We went to church together with the other saints. We talked about the things of the Lord as we went to worship service. I shared my very heart with my friend. And, and he said, he said, the enemies that are surrounding me, they're bad enough. I expect violence. I expect strife and iniquity and sorrow and mischief and deceit and God from my enemies. These things were painful to me. And David said that, that day and night they oppressed him, but he could stand that. 
The thing that bothered him most was that his very best friend turned on him. The psalm was written during David's son Absalom's rebellion, and David's best friend Ahithophel turned against him and became a counselor for Absalom. And if you read 2 uh, Samuel chapter 16 and 17, you'll find that story there. I wish we had time to get into it, but we don't have time to get into it today. But David, he was so hurt. And, and the more he thought about his friend, the madder he got. And when he realized how close close he and Ahithophel had been, when he realized just how close Ahithophel had been to him, he his anger reached a boiling point. And so in his anger, he said, Lord, just let death seize them. Let them go down quickly into hell because of the wickedness in them. My son is betraying me. My best friend is joining him. The one to whom I had opened my heart, I shared my most personal feelings with him. We were closer than brothers. I trusted him. But in verse 16, David began, began to have a new focus. He began to smile in the midst of the turmoil. He began to rethink his position with God. He began to take on a new position and, and a new disposition. In verse 16, he said, as for me, after all of this anger, after all of this, Lord, put them in hell, Lord, just destroy them. David said, as for me, he said, I will call upon the Lord who shall save me. He went on to lift up the Lord in the midst of his issues. He said, God will take care of this situation. I'm at peace in the midst of this tribulation, even though the words of my friend's mouth were smoother than butter. He was saying all the right things. He was pretending to be my best friend, but all the time he was stabbing me in the back. But what will I do? Cast your burden on the Lord and he'll sustain you. He'll never suffer the righteous to be moved, David said. David began to focus on the Lord instead of on the fact that his son and his best friend were plotting against him. He was angry at first, but, but as he focused his attention on the goodness of God, he took a different position. He began to smile through the pain of the situation and he believed that if he cast that burden on the Lord, that he would be sustained. Sister, sometimes things will happen when you least expect it. David didn't expect that his best friend was going to take sides against him. He was devastated, but David understood that no matter what happened, God was his rock and his safe place. He was hurt, yes, but he was able to smile. He was able to refocus his attention on the word. He was able to smile through the pain and understand that in the midst of the pain, there's a ray of hope. In spite of the evil surrounding him and the treachery of his friend, he trusted God and said, as for me, I will call upon the Lord three times a day will I pray. David found the secret of, uh, of it all. David, God will take care of you no matter what. Turn things over to God and let him take care of this situation and rest in him. You can smile through the pain. Sometimes friends may fail you. You know, all of Jesus's friends failed him. His One of his disciples betrayed him. And you know, Jesus went to the cross alone, but though friends may fail, Jesus never fails. He's a friend who sticks closer to you than any sister. And so when things become rough and everyone seems to have turned on you, remember to begin to smile, begin to call upon the Lord, lean hard on him and let him care, uh, take care of you. And in your situation, you can trust him because he never fails. Psalm 27 and one says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The same light that God gave David in the midst of his pain and hurt is the same light that he gives to us. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7. But we have this treasure, this word, this light in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul said, we have this light. We have the treasure of the word. And that light is what we focus on just as King David did. You know, he smiled and he expressed approval of the word. Paul said, because you have this treasure within, you can smile in spite of what your issue is saying. Your issue is saying that you'll be destroyed. You'll be overcome. You'll be defeated. But what is the light saying? The light is saying that you're more than a conqueror. The light says you're a victor and not a victim. The light says that you're a daughter of the king. The light says that you're seated at the king's table. It's it's who you belong to, sisters. You're a victor. You're not a victim. Romans 8, 37 says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And my final point, pain is pain, but. So let's look at some of Paul's pain, some of his distresses. 
In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 through 9, Paul said, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Paul was troubled. Paul was perplexed. Paul was persecuted. Paul was cast down. But let's go back and look closer at these verses. Paul said, we're in pain. He said, we're troubled on every side. He said, we're perplexed. We're persecuted. We're cast down. We're in pain. That sounds like defeat, doesn't it? But let's go back and look at the hope that Paul gives within this same verse eight and nine. Paul says, we're troubled on every side, but we're perplexed, but we're persecuted, but we're cast down, but. So let me tell you about this little three letter word, but. This is a conjunction that's a connector, which means contrary to expectation. But is your bridge of hope. When you're troubled, the expectation is that you'll be distressed or stressed out. When you're perplexed, the expectation is that you'll be in despair. When you're persecuted, the expectation is that you'll be forsaken. When you're cast down, the expectation is that you'll be destroyed. But look at what the but does. Paul said, we're troubled on every side, but, or contrary to expectation, we're not distressed. Why? Because the treasure is within. We're perplexed, but contrary to expectation, we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but contrary to expectation, we're not forsaken. We're cast down, but contrary to expectation, we're not destroyed. Why? But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Verse 10 says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. He is with you. You bear the word in your vessel, 2 Corinthians 4 and 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us, you're filled with the Holy Spirit of power. Sisters, you are saved, you're sanctified, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit of power. I show forth the praises of my living Lord, my risen Lord, his life is within me and that word is manifest in me. I'm in the midst of this trial and I'm dying to self that he might live in me. I look beyond this issue and I see that which will never end. Those issues, the pain is a light affliction. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I can smile because I see by faith the exceeding and eternal weight of glory of the glory of God. Sisters, I can smile because this issue is going to end. It's temporary, but eternity is never ending. I approve. I smile because the word is eternal and I have that word in this earthen vessel. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit of power and I'm dressed in the whole armor of God. Second Corinthians chapter 12, after Paul asked God to re three times to remove the thorn from his flesh, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul said, I'm going to smile through the distresses of the issues in my life and, and this thorn in my flesh. My mind is going to be focused on the Lord and I'll focus on his word. My mind is being renewed day by day and I'm learning how to smile. I'm learning how to approve of that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul said, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, in all the pain that I'm suffering for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I can smile through this pain. I can believe the word of the Lord through my distresses because that's what makes me strong. I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his might, sisters, praise is the key. The enemy doesn't understand praise. He doesn't understand how, how you can lift your voice and praise the Lord and smile through the pain. He doesn't understand how you can be still and wait. He doesn't understand how you can do the unexpected. But because of who you are in Christ Jesus, there are some things that you can know and be confident of. And that's why you can smile through the pain. You know you're a daughter of the king and that you're a part of the, fam the family of God. You know that you can count it on joy when you fall into diverse temptations because you know that the trying of your faith works patience. You know that you serve a God who knows the end even before you know the beginning. You know that weeping may endure for the night, but joy 
comes in the morning. Sisters, don't know how long the night is going to be, but joy comes in the morning. You know that God's grace is sufficient. You remember that we talked just talked about Paul and his thorn in the flesh, but Paul took time to ask God to remove that thorn. But God said, Paul, that may be what you want, but that's not what I want. You want me to remove the thorn, but I want it to remain a little while longer. I'm giving you something that will allow you to stand still and wait on the Lord. Paul was able to smile through the pain and through the distress, the Lord told Paul that he was giving him grace that would be sufficient for him to go on smiling through his pain. There is strength in grace. There is power in grace. There is hope in grace. Grace will cause you to be still and know that God is God. His grace will cause you to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. His grace will cause you to be exalted above your pain and his glory will be seen in your life. You can smile because you know that the Lord is, the Lord is exalted above of anything that you might face in life. He is, a, is exalted through your praise and through your stand. You're God's chosen. You're in his protective care. God never said that you wouldn't suffer distresses in this life, but he tells you what to do when those distresses come. Sisters, understand that God is leading you in the path of his choosing. You're in him and he is in you. He knows He knows all you've been through and he knows what you're going through now. He know, he, and he wants you to know that greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. It's the moments in life, the depressive issues that make you know that you can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Understand, my dear sisters, that, that the eternal is everlasting. Those things that you are experiencing in this life are temporary. They're passing away. Understand that having an eternal perspective will give you the strength that you need to be able to smile, to stand on the word because you know that he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you as you're going through your issues. God never told you not to cry. He never told you not to shed tears, but he's promised that he cherishes your tears. Your tears. I just want you to know that shedding tears doesn't mean you don't have faith. Shedding, shedding tears in the midst of trials is normal. God gave us tears. It's okay to cry, but in the midst of those tears, you can smile because you're standing on his word. You can smile through the pain of those distressful events that are happening in your life. Your tears mean something to God, and he has promised in Revelation 7, 17 that he wipe away all tears from your eyes. And so God didn't expect you, if God didn't expect you to shed tears, why would he give you tears? Why would he promise to wipe them away? Crying is okay, sisters. Thank God for tears. Jesus wept, so it's okay for you to weep and smile in the process. Someone took time in the midst of a depressive and painful situation to smile and write these words. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm worn. And through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me on. This man who wrote these words, he did so as he was confronted with a painful time in his life. Thomas Dorsey, the father of black gospel music, wrote this song as he was going through much sorrow and depression in his soul. He and his wife were preparing to become parents for the first time, but just prior to the birth of the baby, Mr. Dorsey was invited to sing at a meeting in another state. Knowing that he would be able to return in time for the birth of the baby, he left his wife at home and he went to the meeting. He had just arrived in the city where the meeting was being held when he received a message that his wife had just died. He immediately returned to Chicago and two days later, their baby son died. So Mr. Dorsey was grief stricken and he was depressed and he was in pain and didn't know what to do. He said he was sitting at his piano and he began to finger the keys and as he played, these words came to his spirit and he began to sing, precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. It was in the midst of his tears that he began to smile as he stood on the words that the Lord placed in his heart. He wrote one of the most famous and enduring songs in the history of gospel music. These words have been such a comfort to us all and it was in his time of hurt that this song came forth. He was able to smile. He was able to express approval of God's word as he was going through his pain. Sisters, all the things that we sing, those spiritual songs, those, those songs that have come to us as a result of someone else's pain, their personal testimonies of the reality of God in their lives and their ability to smile in the midst of their pain. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. We'll understand it better by and by. 
take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. These songs of encouragement were written by a former slave who even in the midst of his painful issues, he conquered and he moved beyond the trouble to become one of the most well-known preachers in Philadelphia. Mr. Charles Albert Tinley, 12 years old when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, all alone in this life after his slave mother died and his father deserted him. He went beyond the issues and began to teach himself to read and write. He worked as a janitor in the small church in Philadelphia, living in the basement, and he completed his education through correspondence courses. He became the preacher of the same church where he had been a janitor and saw that tiny church grow into a membership of several thousands of all nationalities. He smiled through his distresses. He distresses. He glorified God with his life. He took a position beyond what anyone ever expected, and he smiled his way through. And a young lady who was blinded at age three by a doctor who put the wrong medication in her eyes, but she smiled through her pain and distress to write such beloved hymns as Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. What a friend we have in Jesus. I'm thine, O oh Lord. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Jesus, keep me near the cross. She smiled her way through her distresses, and she was able to know that God's grace was sufficient in her life. Finally, you knew I was going to tell this story, sisters, guys. I love this story. I just want to end with this story that you all know because I've used it so many times. I never get tired of telling it, and I pray that you never get tired of hearing it. Such an encouragement that helps us to know that because of our Lord, we can smile through the pain of life's issues. This man went through times of poverty and death and despair and betrayal and grief and depression and sorrow, but he learned to smile through the pain. This man and his family were having so many distressful issues in their life that the church that they were attending asked them to leave because they, you're having so many troubles. There must be a lot of sin in your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be having this many troubles. So among the many distressful issues that this man and his family, uh, you know, this man and his family lost everything in the Chicago fire of 1871. They lost their 14 year old son to scarlet fever. He went beyond his troubles and he built his business with the help of his family. After becoming successful, once again, he planned a European vacation for his wife and his four daughters. But because of some last minute business, he wasn't able to leave when they left and sent them ahead planning to join them in a few weeks. As the ship was sailing in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there was a tragic accident. The ship that the family was on was struck by another vessel. The ship sank in a matter of a few minutes and all daughters were, 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 were killed, all of his four daughters perished. The wife was among the survivors and when they got back to shore after being rescued, she sent her husband on a wire with this distressing report, saved alone. Mr. Spafford immediately made plans to join his wife and he, as he boarded the ship, which was to take him to Europe, he asked the captain if he would notify him when the ship reached the spot where the accident happened and where his four precious daughters had perished. So the captain did so and as Mr. Spafford stood on the bridge of the ship, looking down into those dark waters, tears streaming down his face in sorrow, in depression, in grief and despair, he began to remember that God was with him him, even in his time of great despair, he began to write these words, words that begin to lift his faith as he turned to the only one who could help him smile in the midst of his pain, the only one who would give him the strength to stand still and wait on the Lord in the midst of his deep sorrow, in the midst of his hurt and his depression, in the midst of this worst trial in his life, in the midst of thinking about the hurt that his dear wife was suffering. Mr. Spafford knew that only God could heal his sorrow, and he began to put on the garment of praise for his spirit of heaviness. He was able to smile in the midst of his tears, standing on his faith in God. He took a position that was beyond what anyone expected, and he began to write these words, when peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffer, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
O my soul, and Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trunk shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Sisters, in the time of personal illness, in a time of losing three precious babies, in the time of my husband's drug addiction, in the time of my husband's allegiance to the nation of Islam and the Black Panther Party, in the time when my husband brought a 19-year-old girl into my home to be my sister wife, in the time of having to file bankruptcy twice, twice, in the time of losing two homes, I learned one day that I could smile in the midst of heartache and stay and on the word of God. And in the moment when my husband was gloriously saved and became a gospel preacher, in the time when he became so ill that he had to have two heart transplants, but in the midst of these troubling times, he impacted hundreds of lives in South Georgia. And in the time when the Lord ushered him from earth to glory, I learned that in spite of distressing and painful times, I could smile. I could count it out joy because his grace is sufficient. His grace was sufficient then and his grace is sufficient now. Sisters, God bless you this morning. Know that God is with you. No matter what you may be going through, remember you can smile through the pain. You can stand on the word. You can express your approval of God's word and not your issues. Remember, sisters, that you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And remember, we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You can smile, sisters, you can smile through your pain. God bless you. I love you all. Lord, have mercy. Go ahead on now, you. Y'all know it. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God. Yes, 